This presentation provides you with some feedback on the two exercises for Module 3 to allow you to judge how you went in completing the tasks. Feedback on the extension exercise will be provided at the end of the course. In the first exercise, we asked you to outline the expected contents of the operational concept for the domestic dwelling system. Remember that the operational concept, or the ops con, is one of the life cycle concepts developed to describe the business and stakeholder needs for the system. The operational concept articulates what the user wants to do, how well it should do it, and importantly, why it should do it. Since the OpsCon is written in the language of the user, it doesn't contain technical language, so the statements, or use cases, are high-level explanations of what the system is required to do. It's important to explain why the system should do something, as these use cases are utilised to derive the technical requirements. Having a rationale as to why the system needs to do something also provides the system designers a way of judging if one operational use is better than another. After reading an operational concept, the reader should be able to understand the likely application of the system, the major constraints on the system's use, the external systems and interfaces that the system is required to operate with, and the operational environment the system is to operate within. So let's look briefly at what's likely to be found in an operational concept for a domestic dwelling system. Here are some of the operational statements that the owners of a domestic dwelling may make, and we'll just focus on them a little bit, recognising, of course, that these are a small number of a very large number of similar statements. A domestic dwelling is likely to be required to provide secure storage of one or more vehicles. Note that at this level, we haven't defined a domestic dwelling as required to provide a garage of any sort or of any specified dimensions, just that the users want to provide secure storage for two vehicles. Any more detail will come from the formal transformation of needs into requirements and then when the logical or functional requirements are allocated to physical subsystems. Now the domestic dwelling is clearly there for shelter so the obvious role is to provide shelter and in this case of course it assumes a family of four. The users will also want sleeping functions. This doesn't specify either again what size those sleeping functions are but just that the user wants the space and the opportunity to facilitate sleeping. In an operational concept, the rationale for this use case could be important. If the user is after a spacious area for a large bed, a narrow room may later be inappropriate. It's likely the domestic dwelling is also required to provide cooking facilities. In this example, the user requires facilities for a family of four. And of course, there'll be many, many more such statements. As well as the potential applications of the system, the operational concept will also contain the major constraints that could be applicable to the system, in our case to the domestic dwelling. One obvious physical constraint of a domestic dwelling is that if it's being built it must fit within the confines of some subset of the block of land. This may be the full extent of the property, but most blocks of land have restrictions on how much of the block or how close to the boundary the dwelling can be built. Now that could be imposed by the council, or it could be imposed by other physical limitations such as the slope of the land or the presence of a nearby cliff. The council may also apply restrictions on the height of the domestic dwelling. This may be to preserve the view of neighbours, or it may also just be to comply with the look and feel of the area in which the house is being built. If the dwelling is part of an apartment block, there will be many limitations on the entire building. The north side may be limited to 10 storeys, the south side to 15 and so on. Another obvious constraint is cost. The example here is the construction costs if the dwelling is being built. There may also be uh, yearly limits on, on maintenance costs which the, the system can't exceed, which is more likely if the dwelling is to be used as a rental property. Another common limitation is time. If the owners are buying or building this dwelling for themselves, then it's likely that there'll be a period of time when they are required to pay for their current accommodation, whether they're renting or paying their current mortgage, as well as paying for the new dwelling. Therefore, delays in the building, due to wet weather for example, may have a significant uh, cost impact on the owners. Similarly, for investors, the longer the dwelling doesn't have tenants is a loss of income over the life of a dwelling. And of course, again, there'll be many, many more issues. The operational concept will also take into account external systems and interfaces. Now these are similar to constraints in many respects, as often they're not within the system designer's control. The location and the connectivity requirements to services are often not able to be controlled, and these affect the intended operation of the system. For example, if the pole where the power enters the building is located on the left-hand side of the property, then the connection to the house must be on that side. 
Similarly, the driveway location is often controlled by the council. If the owner desires a horseshoe driveway, where they can drive in one driveway and then exit out another, may not be possible if the council only allows one driveway to be built into a curb for each property. Property boundaries may also pose problems. If the block next door is vacant, then gaining access to that property is unlikely an issue. However, that may not be able to be relied on throughout the entire life cycle. If the owner of the adjoining property is a friend, then having a gate through the fence to allow access is probably going to be agreeable. It may be appropriate while both neighbours are friends, but perhaps of course if the neighbourhood changes, then that may have an effect on the way in which the system is used. Now similar to other services, the mailbox is an interface with the postal service. The size, shape and location are a consideration. If the owner runs a business from home and expects large quantities of deliveries, the mailbox needs to be sufficiently large to cope with that. The postbox may have some requirements on where the postbox is with respect to the location of the block. Now these seem very trivial issues, but they all add up to be quite significant issues, and there are of course, again, many more of them. The last thing that an operational concept may take into account is a description of the operational environment. In other systems, such as uh, military aircraft or commercial aircraft, the operational environment plays a very large role in the development of the system in terms of what height it's expected to be operated at, how long it's expected to be operated, temperature ranges, uh, snow, uh, hot climates and so on. These things can be easily overlooked in those systems, but even particularly for domestic dwellings. If the dwelling is to be acquired for a city environment or a country environment, then that drives the filtration requirements due to the higher levels of pollution perhaps in a city. Additionally, if the dwelling is being acquired in the countryside, there may be an increased risk of fire if it's surrounded by large amounts of bushland. The climate the system is required to operate in can also have a significant impact on the design. If the dwelling is built in an environment where there is a significant snowfall, then the roof design may also be affected. Similarly, how do vehicles exit when the driveway is buried in snow? If the dwelling is to be located in a location prone to cyclones, there may be additional building regulations for cyclone resistance and the need for shelter in a cellar, for example. In a similar manner to climate, the proximity of the system to the seaside may acquire additional considerations in the design to consider salt spray and perhaps noise from the, uh, the stormy seas. Now, of course, these are just a sample of the consideration of an operational concept of a dwelling. You will have identified a significant number of other issues. Now, as we mentioned, the operational concept is just one of the life cycle concepts. Let's look at another. In the second exercise, we ask you to outline the expected contents of the acquisition concept of the domestic dwelling system. The acquisition concept should provide an explanation of how the system will be developed and then brought into service. This acquisition concept doesn't say how the system will function, but rather how those functions are going to be delivered. To do this, the concept will cover such areas as who are the interested parties and how will they be managed? How are the requirements going to be developed? Who will be responsible for gathering those requirements? Who will be the key contractors and how are they going to be managed? How will the design be developed? And how will the system be built and tested? And of course there are other issues as well. Let's look at some examples of what that means for our domestic dwelling. The selection of stakeholders will be touched on further in the exercises in the next module. In this module, we focus on considerations for the various interested parties of the domestic dwelling. Such people will be the owner, any partners in a joint investment, the project manager, the builder, the architect, estate agents, and so on. The acquisition concept needs to provide further detail about who are these people, what role will they play, and exactly what their responsibilities are. For example, who makes decisions at certain points? Who makes decisions about certain things? These need to be identified early and articulated so everybody knows who's responsible for what acts as part of the system development. The acquisition concept should also discuss how the various parties communicate with each other. Are there regular meetings with each of the different groups, or is there a single meeting with all of the required parties in one location? What happens if the owners are absent from one of those particular meetings? Are there lines of communication set up in the event of a physical absence of any key individual for any short period of time, or are decisions just simply wait until they return? Is it a combination of the two? For example, some individuals may be considered key, but only required at certain times for the system development. So, for example, the plumber has a key role to play, but only when the plumbing is being installed. 
The owner, though, may not want to be present at all of those interviews. They may actually be present for some and have an agent there, or they may rely on the builder. All of these things need to be described in the acquisition concept so everybody's clear about what role each party is playing. Now, in a similar manner to communication, some parties may have time frames that are required to be understood. If, for example, it's known that it takes the council six weeks to review and approve or reject a building application, then making sure the required documentation is provided at the right time is critically important. Additionally, if, if the council sends out inspectors at certain points during the construction, we need to understand the time frames associated with that so that we can fit them into our schedule. And then who's actually responsible for the management of those interested parties? That needs to be documented as well. Are the owners to coordinate all those aspects? Are they leaving it to the architect? Is that the responsibility of the builder? Or is there a project manager that they've engaged to take those things into account? And of course, requirements management is a very important issue. Many projects fail or struggle to achieve the desired outcome as a result of poor requirements management. The acquisition concept should cover in some detail how those requirements are to be gathered and then managed for the system. Once the user's provided and approved the initial functional requirements, that is, the requirements they have in their terms for the system, they're consulted further in the development process to approve subsequent baselines as we move into the uh, subsystem level and in the detailed level of the design. Do they do that themselves? Do they rely on the builder? How heavily involved are they? Or how heavily involved do they want to be? Or can they afford to be? If there's a group of investors, are they all involved? Or have they uh, chosen one of their number to be the representative? Or have they all decided not to be involved but hired an experienced developer to act on their behalf? The builder is responsible for converting the requirements into a physical form, so they actually build the building. Are they involved in the development of the requirements, or is the first time they see it when they get delivered a set of plans and asked to build it? Are they allowed to clarify the requirements directly with the owner, or must they talk to the architect or the project manager? The potential risk in this needs to be understood, as there is potential for lower level technical requirements, such as aspects of the layout and the floor plan, for example, to be changed without reference back to the higher user requirements that the user might have for the system. Perhaps something in the way in which the dwelling has been designed has been optimised to protect, for example, against the cyclone, which means that one aspect of the design is not as good as it can be. The management of the design records, in particular of the requirements, should be documented within the acquisition concept. This is both for the legal protection as well as for future life cycle consideration. For example, if the owner disputes that the delivered product did not match what they asked for, that is, they thought they asked for a single garage and they got a double one or vice versa, having complete design records can identify where and why the design deviated from their original requirements. Similarly, it could be used as evidence in court, for example, if we ultimately end up in a legal battle. Keeping the records for later in the life cycle is also important, as we saw in the last module, as it can be utilised to ensure that any modifications are undertaken in a useful way, with the best information available at hand, reducing risk of the modification failing. For example, as we said before, knowing whether plumbing has been routed through the house will ensure that the owner doesn't accidentally drill into a pipe when putting pictures on the wall. Contractor management is also a very important part of an acquisition concept. For the contractors, there are a number of additional considerations. How are they to be selected? Will the owner go and obtain a number of quotes from potential suppliers, from, from builders, plumbers, electricians? Or will the owner put the whole project out to tender and go through a tender evaluation process for each of those suppliers or for a prime contractor? Once a contract is selected and work is commenced, they need to be paid. How will those payments be set up? Is there a large upfront payment to the builder? who then manages payment to subcontractors, or are there specific milestones that need to be satisfied before payment can be made, either individually to subcontractors or to the prime contractor? If there's a large upfront payment, what protects the owner from the contractor running off without completing the construction work? If there are milestones, who determines those milestones? And then who determines that those milestones have been satisfied and therefore payment can be made? For example, if one milestone is related to the completion of landscaping, is it the owner who decides that it's been completed, is it the gardener, or is it the builder? And then if there's a dispute about the services provided by a contractor, how are they resolved? Can the builder talk to the plumber in the event of a dispute and negotiate, or is it the responsibility of the owner, or the architect, or the combination of owner and architect, or combination of owner and builder? 
These issues need to be identified and articulated in the acquisition concept before the development proceeds. The acquisition concept should cover how the dwelling is to be developed and validated. Is the development testing of the dwelling a phased approach? For example, if the electrical wiring is run through the house and tested completely prior to the plumbing being installed and tested and then the walls being put up, there is some risk in this because if the electrical system becomes damaged during the other construction works, the fault may not be found until the domestic dwelling is being utilised and lived in by the owner. We'll discuss these issues in later modules. What time constraints are there on the development of testing? If the dwelling is to be built in an area where it snows, will it be finished before the snow arrives? If it's to be built in a cyclone-prone area, what construction needs to be completed up to a specific point before the storm season arrives? What other constraints are there on time? There could be curing constraints, for example, on waterproofing in bathrooms and laundries, curing on paint, concrete, etc. All those need to be considered and taken into account in the acquisition concept because they have an effect on when the system can be tested. So when it comes to the verification and validation of the satisfaction of requirements, there are limitations on how well things can actually be tested. If, for example, there's a requirement that the dwelling shall maintain a 20 degrees Celsius temperature, how, how will we actually do that? Do we actually do that over a short period of time by turning the air conditioners on to make sure that it actually maintains that temperature? How do we know that it can do that in all seasons, 24 hours a day, for extended periods? Do the owners want proof of that, or are they prepared to use their warranty to, to be able to uh, ensure that the system meets that requirement? What are the requirements of testing to satisfy the completion of all of the contractual obligations of all of the elements of the system when it transitions from acquisition to utilisation? As we said before, with many other things, there's lots of, lots of other issues to be addressed during the acquisition concept. We've just covered a few to give you an indication of the contents of that concept. Well, we hope you enjoyed the Module 3 exercises. Don't forget, if you'd like to investigate further, you may wish to attempt the Module 3 extension exercise.